Common OR cases for radiology techs. So you guys will see a significant amount of orthopedic surgery uh, at our clinical site. We are a trauma one center. So hips, femurs, knees, uh, tib fibs, ankles, that kind of thing, um, as well as humerus, elbows, um, forearm pinnings, whatnots. These are, you're pretty close for most of these cases, they need us for any screws, plates, anything like that. So you'll see a significant amount of ortho. We do a, a good amount of IM rottings, either tibia or femur, and those usually um, require us to get the C-arm at a certain angle. So you can see how the leg is on a triangle here. And if you can see in this image, the C-arm is matching the angle of the leg. So we have to do that a good amount. Um, this was just a picture of the fracture and then with the rod and screws in place and that will be what it looked like at the end. Um, and this was another image taken of sort of a similar repair, but this one is showing you what it would look like with a external fixator on. And sometimes they have to do that in between um, surgery. So you might see that on the patient as well. Femur rotting depending on the severity of the femur fracture, they may need a rod as well. Um, so we'll do AP and laterals for those. And the rod gets hammered in from the top. Right. And then they screw the screws in, and I'll show you an image of what they call perfect circles in a minute here, but it's retrograde rod going through the femur. Right. Perfect circles. So your surgeon may ask you to find perfect circles. Down here are perfect circles. You can see clearly up here, these are sort of oblong <laughs> circles. They're not circles. One of our surgeons likes to tell you they look more like watermelons or lemons or something like that if you don't have it right. They have to put screws straight through these holes, which is why they want them perfect circles. So you're going to have to use some angles of your C-arm to get those on point. Hip cannulated screws uh, are used for femoral neck fractures. These three screws are going to be placed. They're going to do pins first to get their alignment, and then the screws go over top of that. But um, the screws are going to hold the fractured bone in place. Intertrochanteric fractures. Um, they could use ORIF to place this plate in with the screws. And that ORIF means open reduction internal fixation. So you'll see that term pretty often at our clinical site. Um, if there's an acetabulum fracture or they need to pin an SI joint, you're going to be sort of taking your C-arm and orbiting up over the top of the patient. So you may need to go up past zero for that. Humeral fracture, usually your humeral fracture patients are sitting in what they call a beach chair position. So their head is raised um, and their humerus is sort of at this angle to make it a little bit easier. Depending on what we're working on, your CR may come in like this image here over the top for like clavicle fractures or shoulder something here. Most of the humerus fractures are coming directly in and the surgeon will be sort of standing over here depending on what they want. Um, this was just a sort of a picture of a potential humerus fix uh, with the plate and screws. A lot of our surgeons will use the image intensifier of the C-arm as the table for um, these type of pediatric fractures. So you may have to flip your C-arm. Um, they are smaller on the table, so they won't be able to get the image that they need on the arm bar of the table, and you can't shoot through that. So we just will wrap the II and flip it over and they'll use that as the table directly. Fischlogram, you may see arm and leg fischlograms. Uh, most of our surgeons use the foot pedal. So you're gonna select pulse and low dose on your panel, slide that foot pedal with a bag over it so it doesn't get disgusting, slide it under the table and they will make their exposures. You position the C-arm and save and swap. Porticath studies. Um, they, you're going to center essentially straight over the chest, allow them to see where they are feeding this portacath in. Most often in these, they're going to ask us for a portable chest when the patient is out of the room post-op. They want to look to see if they cause a pneumothorax. And just remember, pneumothorax, you want that patient upright, air to rise, okay? Urologies, 
Some people call it cystos. Um, retrograde pilogram. This is your focus on the kidneys, ureter, and bladder. Most often we're looking for stones. Okay. This is a great non-orthopedic C-arm case if you can get it. You go bladder to kidney, watch for the contrast, watch for the surgeon's eyes, watch where they're looking, take your pictures, and you're out. Okay. They may put a stent in, that's what this is here, into the patient at the end. So that's what that stent is. Bronchoscopy, um, the doctors are going to do a procedure where they go into the lung fields and um, take a little piece of that lung as a sample and send it for testing. They use us to guide the C-arm so they can sort of see their location, see where they're grabbing. And then they most often will ask for a portable chest as well after the exam, again, checking for pneumothorax esophageal dilation. The surgeons are going to place dilators. They're going to increase in size as they go into the patient's um, esophagus if they have a stricture and they're trying to open it. ERCP has a super long name, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. It's a super long name. We go with ERCP, but you're looking at bile ducts, pancreatic duct, and the gallbladder. Um, and remember, we talked a little bit about this when we did upper GI that the duodenum has the um, papilla, the major and minor papilla, and that's how they get in to do these exams. So they're going to go through that and then they're going to send this wire up in to look at the ducts and the surgeon has the foot pedal for this one. Intraoperative cholangiogram. Um, if you go back to our anatomy where the gallbladder sits, Right. They're sending a catheter in. They're going to sort of separate it out and remove that gallbladder. Just do a quick review of this anatomy for me, guys, because this is definitely going to be on your test, okay? This is what um, sort of the intraoperative system will look like. So just being aware of where your C-arm is and making sure you don't run into those pieces. And you're going to try and get this nice image filled with contrast the best that you can. T-tube cholangiogram, the T-tube is placed outside the body. Um, so sometimes we'll do this in the floral rooms as well and not just in the OR, but we're looking for the biliary duct system. So the patient will have something called a T-tube. And so it's a similar concept just through the tube. ACDF is your anterior cervical discectomy infusion. So the patient is going to be anterior. That's what the A is, right? So they're entering the anterior of the patient. So I know when I'm setting up, my patient's going to be supine. Most often you're going to do APs and laterals in the OR. And then usually between three and six weeks later, they come for upright AMP laterals, say miscellaneous. Um, posterior lumbar intervody fusion, your patient is going to be prone. They're on this sort of, um, we call it a rainbow, but it's this black piece that's covered up here with blue, but it sort of rounds their back out. And usually it's laterals. You may do an AP at the end, but usually just laterals only with the CR. T-lift. So there's a specific surgeon that does T-lifts with us at our hospital, Dr. O. He does not allow students to do these cases. Um, you can easily hit these um, the equipment that's in the patient's back, and it's tough to do to go AP lateral um, without hitting those. And he's very particular about who does his cases, but watch them because when you get hired, you're gonna have to do them. Um, so t lift that's what that stands for, okay? Kyphoplasty, we don't do a ton of these, but um, this is where usually the patient has compression fractures. The surgeon's gonna inject kind of a cement mixture into the bone to strengthen it and sort of help the patient not be completely kyphotic, right, and to help the spine be more stable. Spinal cord stimulator, this is what that stimulator is. It's coming in here. Um, usually the surgeon will have you count from um, L5. We're gonna count up and make sure this is T12 and you're gonna center over this area. The patient um, will be awake for this because they have to test the stimulation levels. So they will be talking and communicating to that patient. Patient's prone, um, you're gonna do a prone and then a lateral to see sort of how anterior posterior that is and watch them go up. 
sacral stimulator. It's usually um, used for patients really suffering from incontinence um, or some severe sort of joint pain in the sacrum, possibly. Um, but the stimulator is placed pretty similarly to that of the spinal stimulator. You're just going to center over the pelvis and show them where they are sacrum-wise. Documentation. So something key I want you guys to make sure about for documentation is double check your patient's information prior to sending your CRM images. If the circulator in the room put in your patient info, make sure you have the right patient name on the sticker and the medical record number. Don't send if they've put in the wrong one. You then need to send um, your images with the dose report and make sure you know how to do that both on the 9800 and 9900. On your little card that you should keep with you, you're going to document the fluoroscopy time and your tech time. So when I start a case, I write my start time when they called me in. So say it's 8 o'clock. And then my end time. So say it's 9.30. So that's 1 hour 30 minutes of tech time. And then I look to my C-arm for my fluoro time. And I'm going to document that too. On our little OR list that's outside of our tech area, that white um, sheet. You can either write down the time if the case is done or if the case they're like, hey, we'll call you back. We write DFN done for now um, and then we write it back down on the schedule so we know they're going to call us back. Check that case off on your schedule. Keep track of your schedule. What's been done? What's coming down the line? What can I see? Um, document your case in the student binder. What tech did you do it with? What surgeon? And what date did you do it? Um, Write some notes to include in your OR notebook. I like to write on scratch notes first and then sort of transfer over to my OR notebook later. Always have your OR notebook when you're down in the OR. Don't go to the OR without it, okay? Really important. Notes are key. Um, how, do you, how did you set up that room? How was the patient positioned? What surgeon did you work with? And what, did they, what was their call sign? Did they use x-ray? Did they use picture please? Did they have specific angles that they liked? Um, did they want you in a certain position? What can you put in your notebook that will help you do that case more efficiently, independently, and make you look like a rock star the next time you go in that room? That's what I want you to keep in that notebook. Um, and Deb, at some point, is gonna ask you for that notebook. So, always have a notebook, always have a pen with you, keep track of your OR schedule, and just remember, on that OR schedule is patient names on there. So that can't go in a regular trash. That has to go in a blue HIPAA bin at the end of the day. You can keep that little um, sort of worksheet that Deb or whoever the charge person is gives you in the morning with the cases and um, the times because there's no patient info on that if that's something you want to keep and help you keep track of. And just reviewing your cases, know what's, know what's happening in the case, or at least how the patient is positioned, where they're going. Are they in the lumbar spine? Are they in the cervical spine? What did your tech do? How did they move that C-arm? Being aware of where they stand um, and sort of your radiation protection um, tips as well, right? So just be aware that we're not flooring when we're not supposed to, and when in doubt, always ask if you're not sure if they told you to fluoro just double check say hey you want a picture here um just making sure so it's better to ask than fluoro when you're not supposed to and really irritate a surgeon all right um so i will see you guys for the part three of this discussion momentarily